But when he got back to the car, Aaron was gone. This is according to him. Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, please do subscribe. And if you're old here, hello again. My name's Kate Philpott and I cover true crime and missing person cases on my channel. I am joined by a guest today. She does not want me to hold her, <laughs> but she's here. <laughs> Also, before I actually say anything, I want to address this. My lips are going through it right now. They're going all weird and bumpy, and this happened to me a few months ago as well, and the only thing that actually fixed it was me just totally drying them out. No Vaseline or anything, so if I look like I've just dragged my lips through the Sahara Desert, now you know why. In today's video, we'll be looking into one of the most frustrating missing person cases out there, and that is because there are so many missing pieces in this puzzle. If this was a 200 piece jigsaw puzzle, you'd have maybe five pieces that stuck together in total, and the rest is just unknown. So this is the case of Erin Marie Gilbert, who went missing on a first date at the Girdwood Forest Fair in Alaska. It's so strange. It's the second case in a row that I've covered where a woman has gone missing while going on a first date. If you don't know what I'm talking about, then you definitely need to go and check out the last video I put up about Heather Elvis. It is very, very strange. But other than that, let's get into Erin's case. Erin Marie Gilbert was born on the 4th of May, 1971, and she was the youngest of three sisters. At some point, their parents separated, so Erin and her two sisters lived with their mother in Everett, Washington. But then when Erin Erin got a bit older, she moved in with her father in San Francisco. Erin was stunningly beautiful, around six foot tall, athletic, she was very good at basketball, and very responsible. She was also vibrant, confident, and wonderfully unique. She planned to go to cosmetology school, but her ultimate dream was to become a writer. She also had quite a big personality, she was very funny, and she stood out but in a good way. In autumn of 1994, Erin was struggling a little bit with just figuring out what direction she wanted to take herself and her, her life. Something that most of us in our early 20s experience for sure. <laughs> so she decided to spend some time up in Anchorage, Alaska because this is where her sister Stephanie had relocated to with her husband and their two kids. And Stephanie was so excited for her to come and stay with them. Her husband traveled quite a lot for work so it was gonna be amazing that now her and the kids would have some company. So Erin had been living in Anchorage with her sister's family for quite a while and it became clear that she needed to meet people. So then that first night she went out by herself, she went to a bar called Chilkoot Charlie's and that's where she met Dave, AKA David Combs. They exchanged phone numbers and they planned to go on a date to the Girdwood Forest Fair just a few days later. And Erin was looking forward to it, although she wasn't like, super excited or anything. She was just like, oh yeah, this'll be fine. This'll be good. I get the impression that it was more about the change of scenery and just being out and about rather than, oh my God, I just met this amazing guy. But that brings us right up to her disappearance. On the 1st of July, 1995, Aaron and Dave had their date. He came to pick her up in the late afternoon around 4 p.m. Stephanie met him briefly and she described him as having long dark brown hair with some John Lennon style glasses. And Stephanie got a bad feeling about him and she couldn't put her finger on what it actually was. It was just an uncomfortable gut feeling and ultimately he just didn't leave a great impression. And there's this one little detail that just shakes me to my core. And that's what Stephanie's son said to Aaron before she left. He said, Auntie Aaron, take the cell phone because they had this phone between the family like for, for situations like this. And Aaron said, no thanks, I'll be fine. <laughs> it's unsettling. And even more so, I wonder, did Dave overhear this interaction? I feel like that would be quite interesting to know. I mean, don't get me wrong, that could have happened before he even arrived at the house, so I could be way off there, but it would still be interesting to know, especially considering that Aaron and Dave drove away at around 4 p.m., and that would be the last time that her family would ever see her or hear from her again. So they drove off and it takes about 55 minutes to get to the Girdwood Forest Fair because it was just south of Anchorage. And Erin was seen at the fair, so we know that she got there safely. But from there, the main thing we have to go off is Dave's story. 
let me tell you. I've seen conflicting times, so this was either at 6 p.m. or 6.45 p.m. But Dave and Aaron returned to the car after spending some time at the fair, but the battery in Dave's car was dead because he had left the lights on. Apparently it had recently been made a requirement in Alaska to keep your full headlights on while you drive on the Seward Highway, and Dave just wasn't used to this, so he just forgot to turn them off. He then told Aaron that he had a friend who lived nearby, so he was gonna go get help. But Dave ended up walking around for about two hours because he couldn't find his friend's house. Now, to be fair, it's not like you had an iPhone with your Google Maps in 1995, so there's that. But when he got back to the car, Aaron was gone. This is according to him. But by then, the car could start, so it was absolutely fine. He then went back to the fair because he wanted to look for her, and apparently spent hours looking for her because he stayed looking until about 1am. And that's when he came to the conclusion that she was probably just mad at him, and she made some other arrangements to get home. So. At this point, I want you to pause the video and leave a comment with what your thoughts are as I'm saying all this. I don't want to sway you too much before you comment, so you can come back to that comment and reply to it with your updated thoughts. But when you're finished commenting, press play and I'm gonna raise some questions about the story so far, cause it's gotta be done. All right, let's get into these questions. Time to bring the sass out. Firstly, doesn't it seem awfully convenient that he's got an alibi for a whole two hours after Aaron was last seen? And it's an alibi that nobody can actually confirm. I mean, sure, he could have just gotten lost, but just a thought. But then he gets back and Aaron's just gone. Also kind of convenient. And of course, then the car does start which is even more convenient. It all just seems to work out so well for him to not know anything or not have seen anything and for him to easily have no idea what happened to Aaron or where she went. I also have to wonder if there were witnesses that saw him going back to the fair looking for her and if witnesses did see him back in the fair did he seem frantic worried did he look like he was looking for someone because it'll be a whole other story if someone saw him back in the fair having a few beers or walking around with candy floss i'll raise more questions about this in a little bit but i just want to start your mind thinking about some stuff start your mind thinking i don't even know if that makes sense but Anyway, so the next thing we know that happened is at 7 a.m. the following morning, and this is when Stephanie receives a call. And the call's from Dave, and he asks if Aaron made it home. Stephanie, at this point, goes to look in Aaron's room because she just assumed that Aaron was sleeping in there. But Aaron wasn't there, and the bed wasn't slept in. So Stephanie and her family shoot down to the Girdwood Forest Fair, and they start to conduct their own searches, and they actually met Dave there. When they showed up, he was just eating a hot dog which seems very nonchalant. Regardless, he met them down there, which begs the question, did he stay there all night? Did he go home at all? I mean, think about it like this. He searched for Aaron until 1 a.m. He probably would have had a reasonable commute home. If it was somewhere in Anchorage, it was probably around an hour. So let's say he got home about 2 a.m. or just before. Then he called Aaron's family at 7 a.m. So why was he up so early if he had been awake so late? Could he not sleep for some reason? Was he up all night worried about Aaron or was he up all night for a different emotion? Like, I don't know, guilt or something. And if he didn't go home, that's even weirder. Like, what's the plan, dude? Like, wait there until it's morning enough to ring people to make it look like he's the, you know, reliable, concerned date that she was on. I'm sorry, I can't even help myself with this one. But it's how, the, so many questions for this guy. So many questions. And my understanding of that morning was that they all searched for Aaron together Although the details on that are a little fuzzy. But if they did all search together, I just wonder what was Dave's demeanor like? Was he pointing them in any particular direction? If so, was that to make sure they stayed away from the opposite direction? Like a, you look over there, I've got this section covered kind of thing. Okay, moving into the investigation. When Aaron's family reported her missing initially, the police didn't really hop on it straight away. There wasn't really much movement at all until Stephanie and her family approached the media. They got them to help, and that's when the police hopped on board. State troopers first conducted large searches on the 6th of July. They had helicopters, search dogs, all the rest. But all of this was to no avail. And it is unfortunate that this was literally five days after Aaron actually went missing, 
four days after her family realized she went missing. And Dave did one interview with the media, like just one. And that was published about a week and a half after Aaron disappeared. And since that point, this guy has been totally silent. Totally silent. So where do we go from here? We know that Aaron went to the fair with Dave, but what about people who saw them there? Did anybody notice anything unusual? Anything at all? And there were two main witnesses really that can provide us with any actual information. Both of them were vendors at one of the stands at the fair for hair design and face painting. They both said that a woman and a man came up to their stand and the woman was inquiring about getting her belly button pierced and she was very excited about it. The woman was wearing boots, blue jeans and a black leather jacket which does match the description of what Aaron was wearing that day. And the man had a short military style haircut. They both said that he didn't quite match up with her because he was very formal, very conservatively dressed. They thought maybe he was in the military or he had been a police officer or something like that. And they also noted that he seemed very impatient, like very anxious to go. Both of the vendors said that they seemed like an odd couple. And actually they both theorized that they weren't even together as a couple, that they were just friends or maybe even brother and sister. They definitely didn't get a romantic vibe between them. So there's an elephant in the room now. What's with the haircut? According to Stephanie Juarez, Aaron's sister, David Combs, the guy that Aaron went on a date with, had long brown hair and John Lennon style glasses. That's a very different description to the one that we've just gotten from the vendors. This guy had a short military style haircut and was very conservative. So is it possible then that Dave was telling the truth? Aaron got fed up waiting for him. She went back into the fair, met some other guy, and that's who she went around to the stalls with. And if that was the case, then maybe this new guy took her off somewhere or did something. In which case we really don't have the full story. It's either that or someone was way off in their description of this man. But that could very well be the case because this literally took place in 1995. Now, while we're on the topic of these two vendors who'd spoken to Aaron, or at least who they believed to be Aaron, one of them says that, and this is very specific, one of them says that she believes Aaron is buried in a roadside along the Seward Highway, and also that if law enforcement ever finds her, the vendor's card will be in her jean pocket because she'd been looking for more information about getting a belly button piercing. What made me feel much more emotionally connected to this case was actually something that Stephanie shared on the Alaska Unsolved podcast. It's a podcast all about Aaron's disappearance. And Stephanie shared that three days after Aaron's disappearance, her husband turned to her and said, she's dead. And Stephanie said, I know. Imagine having that gut feeling so soon after your loved one has disappeared. Uh, so soon after you have spoken to them and seen them and like felt them. I just can't imagine what that must have felt like. My understanding of the investigation though, despite those first few days, is that law enforcement have over the years done a very, very thorough investigation. And the fact that we don't have any more details is simply due to the fact that they have been so tight-lipped about the investigation and they have maintained its integrity. And that's the thing though, we don't have any more details. There are so many questions surrounding Erin's disappearance, around her last known movements and what actually happened to her because it really does seem like she just vanished into thin air. There was no crime scene, no evidence of a struggle, no forensic evidence at all, really. No evidence to suggest that a crime even took place. But of course, it is widely thought that Aaron was met with foul play. Now, I'm sure you're wondering about the investigation into David Combs. And the fact of the matter is, he is not and has never been an official suspect. Ever since a week or so after Aaron disappeared, he has stayed totally silent. He has not uttered a word. He has ignored calls from detectives, cold case detectives. He hasn't been in contact with Aaron's family, nothing. There was one occasion where he was due to take a polygraph test though, but he left and went home before he even took it. So that leaves us with what? Just having to take his word for it? It just doesn't sit right with me. What made her disappearance even more strange was that it was such a safe town. So safe. And I'll ask you this, do you feel like your town is safe? Really, really think about it. Because I know I do. 
And even at that, there has been, well, one thing that's happened that was wild in my town. But there are two categories of true crime. On one side, you've got the knackers, the people who are scary to walk past on the street because they look like they could easily have a knife on them. Usually these people are hanging around in the bad side of town. And then there's the other side of true crime. And this is the part that true crime channels, podcasts, and documentaries talk about the most. Crimes of passion, domestic violence, crimes to cover up other things, serial killers even. We talk about these a lot because that's just it. They generally happen in normal neighborhoods, safe neighborhoods, and are carried out by normal people, or at least people who appear normal. And that's why we hear all the time in true crime documentaries and stuff, oh, it was the kind of place where people didn't lock their doors at night, or they let the kids out and you didn't even have to watch them because you knew they were safe, or people left the key in the ignition in your car because you know no one's gonna take it. Because the perpetrators of crimes, like the ones that we talk about in the true crime YouTube world, are hidden among society. They're not necessarily raised in the bad side of town, and that's what makes it so unsettling to hear about. In 2017, Police Lieutenant Randy McFerrin commented on Aaron's case, and this is what he said. We don't know for sure what happened, if this was foul play or not. We just don't know. We don't have any witnesses, we don't have any human remains, we don't have a crime scene, we don't have much of anything. So it's gonna be very hard, but like I said, someone knows something. That's the thing, people don't just disappear. So whoever knows something is keeping a pretty big secret and you just hope that someday they just crack. But ultimately what they really need to solve this case is unfortunately remains. All right, I mentioned earlier that I would have a lot more questions about Dave and his story. So let's get right on into that. And Stephanie, Aaron's sister, put up a post in her Facebook page, Finding Aaron Marie Gilbert, with quite a few questions that she'd like to ask David Combs. And that these are questions that she has never gotten the answers to over the years. And I'll just paraphrase and pick and choose some of them, but some of these are questions that are incredibly interesting to think about. So first things first. What friend's cabin did you walk to to borrow jumper cables? Yeah, I mean, do we have details of him having a specific friend who absolutely lived or lives currently, whatever, at a specific address in that area? Do we know that a person like that exists? Because that could be very telling on whether or not he's telling the truth. Did you ask people close to the car, people you saw at the beer garden or the staff at the store or the bar to borrow jumper cables. I mean, for sure, someone at the fair could have easily had them. And did Dave genuinely not think of something like that? Or was that just his excuse to buy himself time? Because in actual fact, he wasn't going to a friend's house for help. When you were looking for Aaron, who did you ask? Did you ask the band to announce her name that night as the loudspeaker would be heard by many people? Another really good question. Because if you're genuinely looking for someone, you might think to do that. If you're not genuinely looking for someone, you're probably not gonna do that. Is there a reason you didn't call her house at 10 p.m. or 11 p.m. to see if she'd gone home instead of walking around until 1 a.m.? Good question. <laughs> what did you say to Erin when you left her? Did you say, I'll be gone for two hours, wait at the car? What did Erin say when you said this to her? Now, my take on this is that you can't really plan to not find a house. And his story, at least, is that he didn't find the house. So if you are looking for a house and you can't find it, it's obviously gonna take you longer than you expect it to take. Maybe he told her he'd be about half an hour. And then when more and more time passed, then she got irritated and left. But without a doubt, it would be very, very interesting to understand what Aaron's expectations were about how long he would be, if his story is true. Do you have friends in Girdwood who own cabins? Did you take Aaron to a cabin? If that were the case, does somebody else know something? A friend of David's perhaps? Stephanie also asks if anybody in the area gave him a key to a cabin around that time. That could be a really massive clue if he had had access to somebody's cabin for a few days around that time. Maybe that's where he went after 1 a.m. because his own home was too far. I mean, that's under the assumption that his home is in Anchorage, although I don't know. When did you tell your parents what happened? Hmm, do his parents know anything more? <laughs> that's an interesting one. Were you dating somebody else at the time you took Aaron on a date? I don't know where Stephanie got that particular question from or if it's just, you know, thinking about different theories and what could have been going on. 
but it's also an interesting one to think about. But if so, did he have a girlfriend or a wife? If so, how did she react to all of this? Because it wasn't exactly a secret that Aaron had last been on a date with a guy called David Combs. So what did you and Aaron talk about on the way down to Girdwood? Also, I'm curious as to whether Dave had been checked for injuries. Injuries like the ones that you might get if somebody was trying to defend themselves against you. Because it was said about Erin that she was strong and that she would fight like crazy. <sighs> Another question, why didn't Erin just go with him? If he was going to look for help and they were on a date, why wouldn't she just go with him? Or why wouldn't he ask her to go with him? Why was it the understanding that she would stay at the car and he would go and get the cables? Like, you're probably gonna go with the person, right? Unless she genuinely didn't feel comfortable walking into the wilderness, essentially, with this guy that she had just met. Oh. Unless his story was actually true about the car, and they did walk into the wilderness, and she did go with him willingly. Ooh. I hadn't thought about that until this very moment. I've been on dates with people where I'm like, okay, yeah, this is fine. But with us being in a public setting, but I'm not gonna walk into the woods with you. Not that, you know, people have asked me to walk into the woods with them. <laughs> all other thing. But do you get what I mean? Maybe she'd had a gut feeling and didn't really feel all that comfortable walking away from the crowd and the fair, but then just kind of thought, oh, you know, no big deal, I'll be fine. And then it wasn't fine. <sighs> Let me know what you think about that. Another question I have is, did anybody see David walking around for two hours. And how have people described Dave over the years? Is he sociable? Is he personable? Does he work and is he reliable in his job if he does work? Does he snap at people? Does he mainly keep to himself? What kind of person is he? Is he the kind of person that people generally feel there's something just off about? But the most important question out of any question that we could possibly muster up is was he telling the truth? And if not, why not? I'll admit, a lot of these are very loaded questions, but they still stand. And it would still be very interesting to find out their answers. But I also have other more general questions about Erin's disappearance and other things that might have happened to her. Did she go for a walk in the woods and get lost? I mean, it can't be ruled out because they were right beside the woods. And if she did do this, from here, did something happen to her as a result of the weather or maybe wildlife? Girdwood was surrounded by wilderness and mountains. And in those areas surrounding Anchorage, there are moose, there's bald eagles, there's bears and wolves. And I think it's important to note that a lot of people go missing in Alaska all the time. And according to the experts, Girdwood is a place where it's, it's easy to get lost, but it's also tough to get found. Alaska does have twice the national average in the states of people going missing. But then even still, this was a public festival where hundreds or maybe even thousands of people were attending. And how did nobody see anything? Nobody had any alarms raised. I mean, maybe Erin was with somebody she trusted, i.e not a stranger. Which narrows it down a lot because she hadn't been living in Alaska for long and the whole point of her even going out to meet people was because she didn't know anybody. So Dave or a different guy, this military style man. And if she was left alone by Dave, did she go looking for a lift or was, an, uh, was a lift offered to her? If she went looking for a lift and then was met with foul play, that's just pretty unlucky. How lucky was it for that opportunistic attacker if that was the case. Or did Aaron just give up waiting, go back to the fair, meet a new guy, and then something went wrong after that? With a significant difference in the description that Stephanie gave versus the description that the vendors gave, this is possible. That's honestly the one thing about this case that just really confuses me. It really stops me in my tracks of thinking Dave is 100% responsible and I honestly feel very torn. Because of that, I am genuinely very, very curious as to what you guys think about that. But there is just so much that is just fishy about Dave's story, but definitely not enough to eliminate all doubt. 
And then with this series, there's just that one detail. And I know I always say we have to at least entertain the idea of a runaway situation, but I mean, it just doesn't make sense in this situation. She had dreams, she had goals, she was aspiring to be a writer, she was about to go to cosmetology school. There was nothing for her to necessarily run away from. In fact, she was already living up in Alaska, having previously lived in San Francisco, so what was she running from? It's not like she had a stocky ex-boyfriend, at least that we know of. Ultimately, the runaway theory just doesn't make sense here. And I don't know of anybody who thinks that she ran away. But look, the case is still open and it's an active investigation. Erin, if she was still out there and alive, would be 50 years old now, which honestly hurts my heart to even say. I mean, I didn't even know her, but I really just get the feeling that she was the type of person that left an impression on everyone she met and also that she would have done great things in this world. There is a $35,000 reward in this case and her family are still searching now 26 years later. And there is another quote that I'm gonna share from Stephanie because it really puts things into perspective. Just about why it is so, so important to share cases like this. And just for reference, I believe when she says followers that she's talking about the Facebook page. So she said, even 100 more followers can exponentially spread information and then hopefully the goal is that someone hears something that triggers a memory or perhaps the person who knows something. And so it's all about that influence and that communication. This, this applies to every missing person case ever. And this is why I feel so passionately about sharing cases like this. And with that in mind, I would encourage you to go and like the Facebook page, Finding Erin Marie Gilbert. And Stephanie has also recently set up an Instagram page at Finding Erin Marie Gilbert. This woman is amazing to me. Every single morning when she gets up, she says, maybe today is the day. You and I get to wake up every day and just be and just know where all our loved ones are and not have to worry about anything anywhere near this. And that's not to negate any negative experiences you've had, but Stephanie and her family don't get to have that. So if you're watching this video and you lived or were in Alaska in the summer of 1995, or you know someone who did live there or was there at the time, particularly in the Anchorage or Girdwood area, I would urge you to sit with that and think about it. Did you see anything? Or did the person you know who lived there or was there see anything or hear anything? You never know who's out there that has seen or heard something either firsthand or through the grapevine. And you never know what could actually lead to answers. And you can call in an anonymous tip. You don't even have to be identified. All right, let's leave it at that. Thank you so much for watching. If you're intrigued about hearing another story of a woman who went missing, just after a first date, then head straight on over to my last video on Heather Elvis. I mean, she also went missing on a first date, but the circumstances are very, very different. We honestly couldn't even write this. Anyway, thank you so much for watching and thank you so much for 2000 subscribers. You have no idea how much I appreciate every single one of you, honestly. Anyway, <laughs> I will cut that there and I will see you next week. Bye guys. Also, at Kate Philpott underscore YT on TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter. Goodbye.